All right, hello and welcome to CSI 40. Uh, I am your host, Lawton Nichols, and I'm excited to teach you how to program this semester. So let's just jump right on into it. Uh, I'm going to tell you about me. Uh, I should probably get off of this drawing feature. I'm going to tell you about me, and then we will just talk about normal stuff you talk about on the first day of class, and then finally we'll actually talk about some programming. So that will culminate in a little fun example, I think. So let's start with me. Uh, hi, my name is Lawton Nichols, and just in case you never come to office hours, let me start up my Zoom so that you can actually see my face for once. Uh, sure, start video. Hello, my lighting sucks, but this is me. It is nice to meet you all. So I will end this, and quit that. So yeah, uh, my name is Lawton Nichols, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, please call me Lawton if you would like. I will respond to, however, uh, I do want to draw now. I will respond to Mr. Nichols, Dr. Nichols, Professor Nichols. But if you'd like, I'd prefer it if you just called me Lawton. Okay. Uh, I went to Fresno State for my undergrad, so I know a little bit about it. I majored in computer science in all my degrees, and I uh, just finished up UC Santa Barbara for grad school. This is my second semester here, so it's my first year. And other than teaching and programming and all that stuff, I like to uh, do ballroom and social dance, though I've probably forgotten how, given the pandemic. And I also like to play guitar. Uh, and this is my cat. His name is Alonzo, but Lonzo for short. He's named after Alonzo Church, who was the PhD advisor of Alan Turing, but he's very famous in his own right as well. And these are also my two beautiful moss balls, who don't really have the best names yet, so I need to still think about those. Uh, so yeah, this is going to be a weird semester, uh, I'm sure you can imagine. So thank you in advance for putting up with me. We will get through it together, and I will be here as much as I can for you. So let's get started with the logistics of this class, uh, just so that it's all ingrained in our minds. So it's all asynchronous. I'm going to record everything and post it on YouTube. You're going to have it. Okay, so this is the schedule that I want to keep, but we'll see if it happens. Uh, this is what I'm going to try to hold myself to at least. The first lecture video of each week will be up by Tuesday at noon, so we'll pretend this is like a Tuesday-Thursday class with a Friday lab. Uh, the second lecture video will be up by Thursday at noon, and the lab introduction video will be up by Friday at noon. I'll try and do it earlier than that, but this is uh, at the latest, I guess. And uh, as far as exams go, because we don't have a class session, uh, I will give you a window of at least 24 hours to start and take your exams. So. Uh, once you start them, though, uh, a timer is going to start ticking as if it were a real classroom. Okay, so maybe like for a midterm, you get an hour and fifteen minutes or something like that, uh, just a normal class amount of time. And yeah, so that's what you can expect. Uh, and furthermore, about expectations, uh, let's just get them all over with. I do have to say that this class is kind of hard, and I am sorry about that. Uh, there's just a long list of stuff that I have to teach you, and uh, I did not make up the list. Okay, programming is also just a new way of thinking. It's going to be a, a bit weird once you're getting started, and that takes some time to settle into your brain. Okay, and so because there are a ton of topics, there also is going to be a bit of work so that we understand all the topics and can demonstrate our knowledge of them. Okay, uh, as far as memorization goes, this is not like uh, some classes where you can just memorize the answer. You kind of have to come up with it yourself. That's It's going to be a lot of problem solving in this class, and that might be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you feel about that. So you can't really memorize the answers and do well on the tests. Uh, I'm going to ask you to solve problems and translate uh, your solutions into code, okay? And if you're not ready for the workload just yet, I want you to consider taking CSI 1. It's a much slower introduction to programming, and it will prepare you very well for this class. And then finally, remember the rule, uh, every unit is an hour in class, so this is a four unit class, which means you'd spend four hours each week in class, and I'd give you time, if this were in person, I'd give you time to do your work there too. Uh, you'll also spend double that amount of time outside of class doing work. Okay, so you should plan for that. Uh, you might get close to that rule applying for once in, in this course, okay? Uh, but with that all being said, I'm not trying to scare you away. I just want to make sure you're not surprised later. Uh, I am here for you as much as possible, okay? I'm going to spend a lot of time in office hours, and I want you to come to every one of them. Uh, I'm going to be on Discord all the time, probably more than I should, answering your questions. Uh, please come. Get help. Uh, I'm going to be here for you, okay?
So uh, with that, let's talk about the syllabus. Here's the home page. You can click on the syllabus link and click to download slash look at the syllabus. I will make it large by just clicking it one more time. It will open up in a smaller preview here otherwise, but I want to zoom in. All right, so you got the standard stuff, uh, my email and things like that, textbooks. We'll get into all of that. But I think what you care about is like what's going to be in this class. So let's go back to the slides because I've uh, summarized that. So you're going to have like homeworks and programming assignments uh, each week. So labs and Xilabs, those are two different kinds of programming assignments. Uh, and I will talk about those more a little bit in a, in a while. There will be two midterms in this class uh, during like the the first one third of the class after that's finished, so week six and at the two thirds of the class is over mark week 12. Uh, so prepare for that. Grade breakdown, that is on the syllabus. So 10% of your grade will be from Zybook's reading assignments, that's from the textbook. And the other 10% will also be from the textbook website, but it'll be programming assignments, so Xilabs. And then 25% of your grade, though, this is the bulk of your written assignments, of your programming assignments, will be from what I call labs on the virtual machine. So we'll talk about that. So those are the important ones. These are the ones I care about. Okay. 5% uh, of your final grade will be from what I call weekly check-in surveys on Canvas. Those are how I keep attendance, and I will have to drop you if you don't complete them. Uh, and then finally, as far as exams go, there will be two midterms, each 15% and uh, the final will be the remaining 20%. Okay, so uh, that is the breakdown of all the grades. Uh, I will have extra credit, I can promise you that, for at least a letter grade's worth of extra credit. And uh, final exam, this is a weird semester, so I'm not really sure, but uh, if things don't go horribly wrong, you can assume that it's gonna be the Tuesday of finals week. Okay, that's what I would like to have it on, so. If I don't tell you otherwise, you can plan on it being on the Tuesday of finals week. It's a bit odd because usually, like, it's all scheduled for you because you have a class time and that tells you exactly when the final is, but, you know, for us it's going to be made up. So I'm going to try and make it on the Tuesday and give you an hour, uh, not an hour, a day to do it, okay? just like for a midterm exam. So I'll give you a 24 hour window to start the exam. Okay. Uh, due dates, this is something I want to hit hard on. Uh, all assignments in this class, except for this ch the check-in surveys, which will be due a little bit later, those they will be due at 5 p.m. Okay, so I want you to plan on that. 5 p.m. is for me and it makes sure that I'm awake when things go wrong because so many things will go wrong with turning in assignments and like error messages that you can't quite understand and you want all the credit. So I want to be awake and there for you. So I'm going to make the, all the due dates in this class 5 p.m. Okay. I do make an exception for you if uh, one of these things applies to you. If you work full time, you care for a child, or you just don't have a lot of time compared to the normal student, uh, please contact me and I will extend your due dates to midnight. Uh, I just want some kind of proof. Uh, just tell me what, what's going on and we'll set that up for you. So uh, late submissions, uh, I'm going to be pretty lax with late submissions. You can submit your Zybooks assignments, your labs, and your check-in surveys as late as you want, up to the last day of instruction if you want to, uh, but I will hit you with a 50% penalty. So if you skip a week, uh, life is not over and you can turn in everything still for credit, okay, as late as you want. So I, wanna make, I just want to make sure that you actually do the work, okay? Uh, Along with that, this is an odd semester, I know there might be a week that goes by that you're very busy for life things, so uh, I'm going to drop quite a few things in this class. So I'll drop your three lowest labs, those are the most important, and I'll drop four of your lowest side books assignments, so four of each reading, four of each side lab. Okay, so uh, that I think is mostly everything on the grade side of things. Uh, Please remember to get that virtual machine running so you can actually do your labs. It's a computer inside of a computer. It's really cool. Uh, so you're going to work on your labs on those, and you will uh, submit them to our class server. Uh, and that's an automated process that I've made for you. Uh, here it is, if you want to see it. 
Uh, mine looks a little bit different to yours because I've customized it, but like you got a little your own little start menu, you got some programs. I think I put like, extra things on your desktop. Uh, and yeah, it's it's just a normal computer. It's just inside your computer, and I've installed helpful programs on them that will help us for this class that you need. Okay, so please get this working uh, so that you can actually turn your lab in on time. Uh, and uh, if you are in need of anything, like a laptop to put the virtual machine on or a better internet connection because yours at home is not too good, please look at the resource page on Canvas because the, the college will actually provide you with a laptop if you need it and also like a MiFi router thing if you need that as well. Okay, so please look into that if that applies to you. I want to make sure everybody is on an even playing field in this class. So, yeah, I mentioned that there's a server. Uh, you're not really going to talk to it unless you really want to. Uh, maybe at the end of the semester I'll show you how to do that. But everything that interacts with this server is on your side automated. Okay, so your programming assignments will be turned in with a command on the terminal on the virtual machine. So those will copy them to our server. And I've made you accounts, though. That's the one thing that you need to worry about. So uh, let me know if you got added late and you don't have one yet, uh, because this, uh, this account has a different username and a different password to your virtual machine. It's a different computer. It's a computer across the network. OK? And that you will use that account to turn in your, your labs and things. OK? So that is something you need to do. Change your password. Uh, Almost there, almost to the actual lecture. Zybooks is going to be our textbook. So it's virtual, it's interactive, and I'm going to give you homework in Zylabs, and you have to buy it. Okay? It's a really cool place, though. So uh, everything's like, it has some animations for each of the topics. It's, it's really useful, I think, and you will, you will come to love it, I hope. And you can buy it in one of two places. So uh, you can buy it from the bookstore or directly from the Zybooks website. All that information is on our course home page. If I go back to that textbook. But do check the prices and read the fine print because I think, if I remember correctly, it's cheaper if you go through Zybooks directly. But it might be easier to return if you buy it from the bookstore. So you need to look into that yourself if, and like weigh, weigh all the things. Okay, and yeah, all the assignments are currently up, so uh, if anything, I will extend them so there's no use to not get started already. So go ahead and read ahead if you would like, and let us look at that briefly. So CSI 40, uh, I have a Firefox extension that turns everything to night mode, so this is what it will look like for you if you don't have that. And yeah, it might be a little different for me because I'm the instructor, same with my canvas. It'll look different for me because I'm the instructor, but uh, you should see things like these are your assignments. Uh, get started with them. I am dropping four of each of these, each of these Zilabs, each of these reading assignments. Uh, and I encourage you to start chapter three and chapter two reading assignments early because those are the biggest ones in this class. Or I'm front loading your work. Okay? You will thank me for it later, I hope. Uh, but yeah, it's really fun. Uh, you can start reading about things, and there's little animations. You can click Start, and it plays them. Uh, and yeah, I just I hope this is a good time for you. So in addition to these lectures, that is Zybooks. And Zylabs will be you completing uh, programming assignments. So just check all these assignments for what to do. And then you'll have like a little editor, and it'll tell you what to do and give you some starter code and stuff like that. Uh, do not be afraid. We'll get into this later. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to teach you how to code in this lecture as well. I think that's all I want to talk about for Zybooks. Uh, finally, Discord. So I'm going to try Discord this semester. And uh, this is how you're going to talk to me if you have like uh, any questions or you want to send me like you want to interact with your peers with questions you want to send me a private question things like that I will post announcements so try and get on this discord as fast as you can you'll like read this welcome message like click all these emojis to add your proper roles for which class you're in you'll definitely click the cat because you're in CSI 40 optionally add your uh, your pronouns read the guide to see how you can write cool formatted messages with code uh, and yeah, you can talk to me in CSI 40, or you can send me a direct message, a DM, 
uh, by right clicking on me and going to message. It doesn't work for me because I am me, but uh, you should see this, this message thing that you can click and send me a private mes message. So that is Discord. Uh, hopefully that is useful and we will get some use out of it. Uh, I will not accept your Discord friend request, I'm sorry. Uh, and as far as questions go, I encourage you to ask as many public questions as you can in the normal channels so that your peers can also help when I'm like asleep or something. Uh, I don't want you to share all your code though publicly. So if you are going to ask a question, ask a question that includes a ton of code, uh, use your judgment, of course. I would prefer it if that were a direct message to me. Okay. And I would much rather you send me a Discord message than an email because my email is disgusting. Okay. And I will try to respond within 24 hours on weekdays and 48 hours on weekends. Uh, sorry if I am online on Discord, but not responding to new not responding to you. I don't hate you. I'm just probably doing something else because I belong to other places on Discord. Okay, so uh, we're almost done with the logistics. Uh, I do want you to come to office hours. They will be on Zoom. They will be virtual. Uh, check Canvas for the schedule. The schedule might change. I do want to say that because all of the meetings that I know I have to go to this semester, they are not yet scheduled. So uh, just go to Lawton's office hours and the schedule will auto update itself so i would like it to stay as it is but i i'm not sure if i have to change it yet uh okay so just keep keep your eye on this and you can click this link to go straight to my zoom okay so i will be available during these times but they might change again okay this is when i would like to be available at least so five hours you have options uh, you can also make an appointment if you ever need it uh and then finally before we get started on the actual stuff this class is difficult, it's challenging, you will get stuck. And I really want to be there for you, or you can go to the uh, tutorial center, whatever you want. I want you to ask for help though, okay? There is no virtue in staring at your screen for two hours, not knowing what to do, okay? I want you to get help so that you can move on to the next problem. Okay, so let's say, let's pick a time. If it takes 30 minutes, you're still staring at the screen, you don't know how to continue with whatever problem you're on, please ask for help, okay? It could be on Discord, it could be a private message, it could be through the tutorial center. I want you to get help when you need it, okay? Don't wait. Uh, it's my job to get you uh, past whatever is the problem and on to the next problem, okay? That's the idea. And uh, that being said, 30 minutes, that's, that's some time. So getting stuck for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, that's what it means to be a programmer. So you should expect that, okay? So with all of that, we are now finally ready. Let me get some water. I've been rambling. We're ready to talk about the meat of this class, okay? So I'm gonna throw a lot of stuff at you today. Uh, you're gonna get so much practice with it though that it's not gonna be daunting anymore, okay? I want you to try out all this code yourself if you can, uh, cause I'm gonna give it all to you. Uh, you're going to get a copy of all this stuff. And yeah, these are my goals for you. Let's get started. So we're first going to learn about computers and programming. Okay, just get ourselves at a base level of all of these different concepts. Okay, so a program, I'm sure you've heard that word before. You're about to learn to program. It's just a recipe. Okay, so think of it like a recipe. It's a sequence of steps. Uh, so in a, in a program, you usually write a bunch of algorithms, and those are just sequences of steps that solve a, a certain problem. So for example, you can write an algorithm that makes a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And if we were in class, I would ask you like to get into groups and be like, okay, come up with your recipe. How do you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? And I'll pretend that I'm a computer because I want to I read your program. I want to run your program, execute it. So how do you go from, I don't know, peanut butter and jelly. Think about this, pause the video, write your algorithm and like a bag of bread, the slices and everything. How do you go from all of these to that? How do you do it? And if you're anything like I was before I learned to program, you'd probably tell me something like this. Oh yeah, peanut butter and jelly, it's, it's super easy. Just take a jar of peanut butter or take some peanut butter that's the idea. Take some peanut butter, take some jelly, and put it on some bread. And if I were the computer, this is what I would say. This is what I would do. This is how I would run your program. Yeah, all right, I got some peanut butter, I got some jelly. I'm gonna put it on 
Whee! I'm gonna put it on this bag of bread. Yeah. That's what you wanted, right? Voila. So easy. I have made you peanut butter and jelly. That's not what you wanted, though, was it? So, uh, this is the first lesson, I guess, is that computers are very, very smart. They do things very quickly, but they're also pretty dumb. They, they have to be directed for each little thing that you want done. Okay, you have to, you have to spell it out to a computer. So you have to think in terms of a computer, which uh, there's a fancy term for that called computational thinking, and it's important, uh, important enough for me to put in bold, I think. So I want you to learn to, how to, and you will in this class, to think in terms of operations that the computer can actually perform. So, uh, for example, this is not what we wanted. We wanted something like, okay, get a plate out of the drawer and put it on the countertop. Take two slices of bread out of the bag. Open up the peanut butter. Open up the jelly. Use a knife to put them on e one of each uh, slice of bread and then put the two slices together, something like that. That's more at the computer's level, okay? So you'll think in terms of the operations that the computer knows how to do, okay? And for each problem, you have to learn to break it down into bite-sized pieces, okay? Uh, because that's all a computer can bite off, I guess is the idea. And also, programs are sequential. You can think of them as, okay, we do this first thing, then we do this next thing, then we do this third thing, and the fourth thing, in that order. We might come back to do other things later, uh, to do the same thing again, or we might move on, but there's an idea of sequentiality, okay, if that's a word. So think in terms of, I do this thing, then the next thing. That's what a recipe is as well, right? So yeah, just prepare for you, you to not have the best time when you're starting out, because things to a computer are very different, even when to you they might look the same, okay? So. Let's move on. More topics, more definitions, and I promise we'll get into code soon. Uh, so here are some important terms that you will read about in your book, and we will cover in depth later. So an algorithm you already know now, it's a recipe. Uh, testing is what you do when you don't trust your program, uh, and you never should as a programmer, because I'm going to make plenty of mistakes in this class, and uh, I've had quite a bit more experience than you, so you're always going to make mistakes. And so testing is like, okay, let's eat that sandwich and see if it tastes good. Uh, assumptions are key, and they are the backbone of a good solution. So an assumption is just whatever is required in the solution, but is not actually mentioned in the problem. Like, okay, this assumes this problem assumes that you actually had peanut butter and jelly and bread in your fridge. If you didn't have that, I mean, the first step of the program would be good to go to the store, right? So assumptions are key. Uh, same for like, hey, if you want to light a birthday candle. Uh, the manufacturer isn't going to give you your money back if you try and light it underwater because they assume that you won't be there. Okay? And then finally, computational thinking. It's thinking sequentially, in order, thinking clearly, and at the right level of, of abstraction. So at the level that the, that the computer can understand you at and understand your intentions and wishes. Uh, and so that's the goal of this class. So we're going to teach you computational thinking and I'm gonna guarantee it, okay? So uh, let's go on to a computer now, the first real diagram. Uh, so there are a bunch of different parts of a computer that you'll read about, and I just wanna touch on them right now so that we just have them all in our minds. So you have quite a few different high-level things that you can, uh, high-level classes that you can like split off a computer into, okay? Here are some of them. Uh, input devices are things like your keyboard, things that you give information to the computer. Okay, so like you're giving information. Provide information to the computer for it to use later. So like you give it input with the keyboard, with the mouse, with a touch screen maybe. So those are input devices. Uh, you also have output devices, of course, because you want to see the results, the fruits of your labor, of your inputs. You've got screens, of course, you've got printers, and those uh, like give info to the computer and output devices are for receiving information from the computer okay and you might have heard of this thing called the CPU it's like the brain it's the processor as well same those are synonyms 
it's the brain of your computer and it's what runs your program. It also, uh, we, we say executes in computer science. It's not like killing your program or anything. It's just a synonym for run. So the processor is where all the thinking happens, okay? All the results like, okay, your keyboard, press the A button, the CPU has to process that and maybe like, okay, add the A here, something like that. And uh, the processor and the memory work in tandem. So uh, the processor has a little bit of memory, but it can't hold on to everything. So the main memory or the RAM of your computer is where like every thing the computer is running currently is stored. So it stores information about running programs and everything uh, that you want to run. So all your programs, they get copied into the main memory before they're run so they can run quickly. Okay. That's the idea because uh, memory is very fast to access. RAM is quite fast, relatively at least. And so we want all the stuff in the main memory to run a program. And that's why like if you're program if you have an old computer and it runs very slow with recent software, it's because that software expects more RAM. And so you're copying things to your hard drive more often than you should to make up for it. Okay. Uh, finally, secondary memory, uh, it's a lot cheaper. And so it has more space. Okay. Things like hard drives or flash drives, uh, they hold a lot more info than RAM might, but it's relatively slower to access quite a bit more slower actually. Uh, and so all these things are working together. The input devices give information to the computer, the, the processor processes it, maybe saves information from the input into memory. Uh, maybe if you're going to load a program, you got to bring it in from secondary memory into the RAM so that it can be run, and maybe you're, you're giving input to that program, executing it on the processor, of course, and then displaying the output to the screen. Okay, it all goes together. So this is just a high-level idea of what a computer is doing. Uh, we will look at this a bit more in depth as necessary. Okay. So now we can finally get to this thing called C++. This is the name of a programming language. Okay. And it was invented back in the day. This is not a typo. It's a man's name by, let's put them all on the same line. Actually, it was invented by a nice Danish man whose name is Bjarnes Trostrup back in 1985. So it's been around this language C++. We're going to learn it in this class. This is Bjarne. And it's based on the C language, so the plus plus is kind of like a, a joke, and you will learn why soon. Uh, and it's what's known as a high-level language. So uh, that means that it looks quite a bit more like English. So don't be afraid, because we're going to write code, and it's going to actually look like real words, mostly. Uh, it's going to look more like English than ones and zeros that you might imagine a program to be, because like, yes, in your memory, these things are all made up of ones and zeros, and same same down here but eventually like at a higher level we we write code that's eventually translated down to that okay so we don't worry about the ones and zeros too much in this class okay it all gets compiled down for us okay so c++ is what's known as a compiled language so there's another program that we're going to run called a compiler that converts our nice high level english looking syntax to the ones and zeros that can actually run on the processor Okay, so it's all coming together uh, and we're ready. We're ready for our first program. Okay, I'm going to show you the simplest complete program. It's going to do absolutely nothing. Just to show you, just to get us through the motions of writing our first program. Okay, cute screensaver. So I'm going to go to Visual Studio Code. That's the program that I would like you to use as you start out, unless you know a fancier one. Okay, so here it is, Visual Studio Code, and uh, I have a place that I want to work in. I've shared some folders with myself. I've actually shared my entire drive with myself. Uh, and I would like to save my code in my Windows desktop. I made a little shortcut to that. Uh, and then in my S21 code from class folder, and inside of that, I want to store it in my CSI40 folder. Okay, so I'm going to just drag this in here, actually. Visual Studio Code is fine with that. And I'm going to make a new file in this folder. So new file. I'm going to call it do nothing. And it's going to be .cpp. Okay, I hope you can see that. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more here for just a second. There we go. So it's going to be called do nothing.cpp. And uh, .cpp is 
the customary file extension for C++ programs, okay? That's the idea. So I'm going to click enter, and so now I have it. It's a blank file, and I can start typing. And I'm going to make it huge for you. Uh, so much better. Okay, sorry, I should have done that a long time ago. Uh, so I'm going to write the simplest program that does nothing, okay? And I'll explain it soon. I'm going to say int main. Open parenthesis, close parenthesis. Open brace, and it automatically inserts a closing brace. Enter. This could all be on the same line, by the way. It's just prettier this way. And I'm going to say return zero semicolon. And I'm going to save it with Control S, Command S, if you're on a Mac, Control S, and uh, then we're good to go. Actually, not if you're on a Mac, sorry. Uh, if you have Visual Studio Code, as a program on your Mac, but it will actually be Control S because this is through the virtual machine, isn't it? So this is three lines of code. It, it counts them for you. And uh, there's nothing wrong, so it's all beautiful looking. And so now I want to compile and run this, OK? So uh, let me see if that's what I want to do just yet. Uh, yeah, I'm going to compile and run it for you. Then we'll get into that later. So I'm going to start up the terminal looks like this. I'm going to navigate to our folder with our code. Don't worry, I'm going to explain all of this in just a second. I just want to show you this program running. I'm going to go CD, Windows Desktop, S21, Code from Class, uh, CSI 40, Lecture 01. So here's the file, do nothing.cpp. Uh, I'm going to say G++ standard equals C++ 17. Don't worry, I'm going to show you all of this. I'm going to tell you why it's like this do nothing.cpp and if i hit enter it compiles the program into a file called a.out you can see it here you can actually uh, open it up in your file browser if you wanted to uh, it's all here dun 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 dun, dun. there it is a.out you can see it here as well a.out and if i want to run it to execute it oops <laughs> wrong visual studio code if I want to run it, I say dot slash a dot out and hit enter. OK, I'm about to run the program we just wrote that does nothing. And oh man, it did nothing. Yay. OK, so that is the simplest possible program. Uh, and we just compiled and run it and ran it. So uh, now let's talk about things. OK, uh, useful terminal commands and info. This is There's a lot on this slide. Uh, and we'll be coming back to it. So I'm going to show you many things. So let's get started. When you start your terminal, and the terminal is where you'll be doing a lot of your work. Uh, maybe not the actual coding, but a lot of the work will happen here in this thing called the terminal. Back in the day, all there, was, all there was was a terminal. Like your computer looked like this, and you had to use it like a terminal. Like you got to log in, and this is all you had. You could edit files, you could see things. This is all you had. And now we have a Windows program, a windowed graphical program that does the same thing. Uh, so when you start your terminal, you're plopped into what's known as your home folder. That's like your users folder uh, in Windows. You also have a home fo folder if you're on a Mac. So this is like your folder. It has like your desktop in it and things like that. But its shorthand is called tilde. Okay. So once you start a terminal, it always plops you in your home folder because you live there, right? Moving on, that's your home folder. You can always get back there by using tilde. And uh, the terminal always has a concept of a working directory. So you're always doing stuff, and you're always inside of a certain folder. So once I see tilde here, that means that I'm working currently inside of my home folder. So I can see all this stuff here that is my home folder and its contents. I can say ls, hit enter. That's a terminal command, ls. It means like list, list all the files. And so then I can see what's there. OK, so just like I'm in this folder on the graphical file browser, I can be in it on the terminal as well. That's my current working directory. It's tilde. It's my home folder. OK. If you want to know where you are, pwd shows your current working directory. It, it spits it back out to you. So if tilde isn't good enough for you, or if you want to see the full path of how you got there, tilde is short for, for me, slash home slash lot and nickels, because I have my own account. For you, it will be slash home slash seaside. Okay? 
that is my current working directory. That's where I'm doing things. I'm working inside of it. If I want to make a file, it'll be made in this directory, unless I say otherwise. OK? If I want to change directory, cd, that changes your directory to be inside of a different one. So if I say cd folder name, that will change my current working directory to be inside of folder name. So I can start working there. OK? So let's cd to uh, my Windows desktop because I want to get to my code from, code from class. Say ls to see what's there. We're almost there. S21, code from class. Uh, inside of there, there's a csi40 folder. cd csi40, ls, c like 01. And you can type a tab to have it autocomplete for you. That's useful. And now I'm inside of my like 01 folder with my a dot out. Cool. Uh, we made it. And if I want to know where I am now, because it only shows the last folder that I'm in, this is the full path. So slash home, slash lot and nickel, slash windows desktop, slash s21 code from class, slash csi40, slash lego one. That's where I am right now. OK, we're there. Uh, if you want to go out, like you want to go to the parent directory, you can say cd dot dot. And that moves you out one to what's known as your parent directory, so the one that contains you. So my parent directory from like a one, it is, uh, if I go here, dun, dun, dun. am I here somewhere? There I am. If I go out to the parent directory, that's just csi40, OK? So if I go out, it's the one one before it, the csi40 here, cd dot dot gets me there. It's a shorthand for that. So now I'm in csi40, and I can go back into the like a one if I want to. And I think I will. OK cd dot dot. Uh, there are text editors, which actually I will talk about on the next slide. So let's let's not go there yet. Uh, if I want to compile a program, I use G++. So G++ is my compiler. It's the stands for GNU C++ compiler. And that's what it does. Uh, it compiles my programs to machine code that I can run. So if I say G++, I say standard equals C++17 as a little compiler flag. This tells us to use the C++ 2017 version of the language, which is like the, the latest and greatest. Uh, and then you give it the name of the program that you want to compile, and it makes it for you. Okay, it compiles it for you. And it'll always be called a dot out unless you say otherwise. So you say dot slash once you're in the, the folder with this a dot out file, which is your your code that you want to run, you can say dot slash a dot out, hit enter to actually run the thing. OK? That's that. Uh, so the dot slash just means, hey, I'm in this current directory, because dot is short for my current directory, just like dot dot is short for my parent directory. It's saying, OK, in my current directory, run this thing, please. So that's what it's doing. And yeah, so G++, it's the GNU C++ compiler. I'll put it there. And that's all I wanted to show you here. I can cover it back up or not. Uh, there we go. OK, so let's move on now to actually editing code. So you're going to write things. You're going to write your code in a place called an editor. And there's a bunch of them. OK, editors are just programs that you can edit files in. They can be terminal based or graphical. Visual Studio Code, it's a graphical editor. So I want you to use this one as you're starting out if you don't know another, because it's a headache to learn a an editor as well as a programming language at the same time. That sucks. Okay, that's no fun. Uh, so let's uh, just get, give you a head start by using Visual Studio Code. So please, if you'd like, uh, use that one. There may come a day where you need to edit code on a terminal. So you have some options. You can use nano, say nano file name, to start editing an existing file or creating a new file. And here's how you can use it. I can say nano do nothing.cvp to re edit this file. I can move around with the arrow keys and start typing things like blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'll make it what's known as a comment. Tab in. Uh, and then all these things at the bottom tell you how to use it. Like control X, this caret means control. So if you say control X, it's going to be like, oh, yes, exit. And you can say, do you want to save? Yes or no, Y or N. I'll hit Y. The file name, yes, I want the same one. So you can just hit enter to keep it the same. And so now I've changed that file, and I can look at it in Visual Studio Code, and you can see it got changed. OK, 
So that is one editor. There are some others, Vim and Emacs. Uh, those are both terminal editors. Emacs is also a graphical one. I prefer Emacs, uh, and I will use it eventually once you, I can get you comfortable enough with your Visual Studio Code to just use that yourself. OK, so uh, none of this really matters. Just pick one and roll with it. I would prefer it if you use Visual Studio Code because it has the most features for a beginner. OK. Uh, Vim and Emacs, though, uh, there's a bit of a war going on between them, just in case you didn't know. Uh, so I don't want to start any wars in this class. So I use my Emacs with, uh, I make it like Vim. So you can read this funny comment if you'd like. It's from XKCD. It's beautiful. Uh, so yeah, I get the best of both worlds with my editor. Uh, why C++, you might ask? Uh, I have to motivate it for you, right? So it was made in the 80s. Why, are we, why do we care about it? So it's actually on the lower side of high-level languages, if that makes any sense at all. So we, not be, we may not be writing zeros and ones, but uh, we're, we're close to the hardware. We're, we're close to the, the memory and the CPU in a way that's not the same in higher level languages. Like uh, maybe you've heard of Python or Java. It's a bit different to those, OK? Also, it's very fast compared to other languages. Uh, if you've used Python before, that's like the usual one that people start out with. Python is very slow. <laughs> so if you thought Python was fast and you've used it before, you're in for a treat with C++. Uh, and then finally, all the cool kids are doing it. So uh, all the Adobe apps, all your browsers, a lot of your games, they're written in C++ for speed purposes, for low-level purposes. OK, so uh, C++ is a good place to be, and it's a good thing to learn first, I think. And let's move on. So uh, the last piece of the puzzle before we start like writing programs full time is to understand what compilation really means. I told you it's like translating down to zeros and ones, but what does this really mean? So you write a C++ program like, I don't know, do nothing.cvp. And you give it to this thing called a compiler, G++. And its job is to translate your single program into machine code or object code. Those are synonyms. And those are zeros and ones, binary stuff. Uh, and then finally, uh, it's, it's quite possible, and usually the case, that your one program doesn't exist in a vacuum. You write it using other things, like libraries. Uh, which are pre-implemented pieces of code that make your life easier. Like, we'll, we'll include the IO stream library in just a second, which gives us printing features like cout and input features like cin, which will be very useful for us. And so uh, after we get object code for our one program, we want to combine it with other programs that have already been made for us using this thing called a linker, which in our case is also G++. <laughs> It does both for us, just under the hood. Uh, at least at the beginning, it'll be under the hood. And then finally, we have a program that we can actually go and run. This is our a.app. OK? That is runnable. It knows where everything is, and it can run our programs to completion. So after compilation and linking, that both of them together, you have a machine code program that you can actually run. OK? So at this stage, you can't actually run your program yet. OK, it's got to be linked first. So that is the story, uh, and now you know it. So we're ready. We're ready to write some programs, and I'll show you a cool one, and then we'll get out of here. All right? And that'll be the first lecture. So let's write some programs and learn some C++. I'm excited. So the first program that you're supposed to ever learn in a computer science class, if you learn a language, every time you learn a new language, actually, you're supposed to write this Hello World program. Like, uh, it's, uh, it's customary. It's supposed to be like you have made your language that you just learned finally do your bidding you're doing the simplest thing you're printing something like your your language is now sentient it's talking back to you saying hello world i exist okay so let's get started and write a hello world program after i get water okay so uh let's get started now i'm going to use our starting point, this this do nothing code, is a good start. Uh, so I'm going to type that all over again. 
I'm going to make one new file. I'm going to save it as uh, hello.cpp. And so I'm going to do some things now. I'm going to start with int main. And I'm going to type in return zero. And now I'm going to explain these things finally. OK, so uh, I'm going to explain them in the code itself using things called comments. OK, this, anything where you have two forward slashes, that begins a comment. This is a comment. This is a single line comment. And I can write as many of it as I want on multiple lines. Uh, this is not interpreted by the compiler. The compiler does not look at comments. So comments can be slashes for single line comments, but you can also have multi-line comments to save you from having to type slash slash every time. So this is a multi-line comment. I'm sure you can see how that's useful. So this is just for us. I'm explaining things to you. The compiler doesn't care. This is the real code. It's outside of a comment. But uh, this is very useful, and I'll write a ton of them for you. OK? So those are comments. And now let's let me explain this code now. So this first line, it's saying uh, it's defining this thing called a main function. OK, and this is where our program starts. Programs always start in the main function. That's where it begins. OK, so uh, the int means that it returns an integer. So that's why we say int there. Uh, and the two braces mean, or the two parentheses mean that it is a function. We'll get into that later. And the braces delimit how far main goes. So uh, main exists only between the braces. It's like a paragraph in writing. So that's that. And then return 0 gives back an answer. So return gives back an answer from this function. And we're, we're returning back to the terminal, in fact. Uh, 0 means 0 is an integer. And it means that everything was successful. The program ran to completion successfully. It's just custom. Uh, 0 means that the program was successful. So when we actually run this program, it does more than just nothing. Uh, back if we say dot slash a dot out again. It did more than nothing because it returned 0. And you can actually see that if you do this fancy command on the terminal, which is not necessary to go over. Uh, we actually noticed that. OK, so this is our code so far. But I want to do stuff. I want to print hello world. OK, so I want to include this thing called iostream because that gives us printing abilities. OK, somebody wrote a book, kind of. We're calling these things libraries. Somebody wrote a book with stuff that we can use. OK, so iostream is a library that includes cout, which we are about to use. OK, so you say include with a number sign, and then the name of the library in between these little uh, less than signs and greater than signs. So we're going to include this library so that we can use its features, which include cout. That's one of them. So cout, or standard cout prints to the screen. OK, so we're about to use this. And I'll get into these in a second. So I'm going to make this hello world program now. So I'm going to say standard C out hello, comma world in quotes. And then uh, this is going to be how it is for, for the beginning. So this is the real program, everything that isn't a comment, include IO stream, main, and stuff, return 0. We're there. So I'm going to compile this now. Here's my stuff, g++, standard equals c++17, hello.cpp. And so now it's going to become a.out if there's nothing wrong. And I can run it now with dot slash a.out. It got replaced. Hit Enter. And it says, hello world, and then a little percent sign. Uh, what that means is, uh, actually, if you run it, it means that it didn't uh, give back a, a new line. Sometimes. 
it'll work like this. Like, I'll give you back your terminal prompt on the same line. We forgot to add a new line, is what it's telling us. Okay, we forgot to press enter, is the idea. So in order to press enter, we say backslash n. Okay? It's called an escape character. It stands for new line. Or people like to put them together and make it one word. So backslash n presses enter for us on the terminal. And so it like puts the uh, program back, or it puts the words on its own little line. Okay? And I was just typing the up arrow to get at my previous commands. That's super helpful. Okay? And now we type hello world on its own line, and we are happy. Okay, so uh, let's talk about things. So we just did quite a few things. We used standard cout. If you don't want to use backslash n, you can give multiple things to cout. You can do this. You can split it up. Like first say hello, then say world. You just put all the things that you want to say in between these little two less than signs. There's like an arrow pointing to cout, like pointing to the screen. Please send the data there, please. Hello world, it still works. So you can put as many things as you want in between these little things. Uh, these output operators, we say. And if you don't want to say backslash n, you can say standard end l. OK? That also becomes backslash n. So you recompile that. You have options when you're programming. There's not just one right answer. OK, so uh, one last thing. We can skip the standard colon colon if we want, because uh, standard colon colon just means IOStream, all its stuff, it lives in what's known as the standard library. OK, that's what we like. Uh, so if only, we could just say, hey, we're using the standard library. Standard colon colon blank gets blank or uses blank from the standard library. Okay, and if we just wanted to say, hey, I want to use everything with standard and I don't want to type it, we can say using up here, using namespace standard, and this makes it so that we don't have to say standard colon colon all the time. So now, instead of this, I'll comment out this line so that it's not code anymore. I'm going to write this code without the standard colon colons. And because we said we're using the standard namespace, we don't have to include those. Let's recompile, rerun, and voila, nothing has changed still. OK, so that is what we do. To skip the standard colon colon, we say using namespace standard. Uh, we're almost there. Uh, let's see here. Let's talk about strings quickly. A string is whatever you put between quotes. Okay. So hello comma space with another quote is a string. So everything between quotes is what's known as a string. It's like a string of characters, like on a friendship bracelet or something. Uh, okay. That's a string, and that's what you can send to see out to type things for you, to print stuff. Uh, and backslash n is known as an escape character, so it gets replaced with things. There are other escape characters. So backslash n is new line. There's also t for tab. And there's plenty more, uh, but this is probably good enough for now. Uh, backslash r, like it's called carriage return. I encourage you to try out what that does. So you can type things on multiple lines, use these escape characters in your code. If you want to type an actual backslash, you have to do two backslashes now. Uh, because otherwise it thinks you're about to use an escape character. And so that's our first program, guys. We did it. Uh, I just want to do a simple math program now, because IOStream also gives us a uh, an input thing. Actually, I'll wait for the input. Uh, let's calculate the area of a circle, though. 
Okay, so let's do that. I'm gonna make a new file called area cpp and I'm gonna include all this thing stuff that I did before include IO stream for C out for standard C out using namespace standard so that I can skip the standard colon colons and then int main because that's where my program begins and there's always a return zero at the end and now I'm gonna say okay uh, what was the radius of our favorite circle? I don't know, five, maybe? Uh, so let's see out the result of pi r squared. So pi five squared, maybe, or 5.5. 3.14 times 5.5, and then to square it, we'll just multiply it by itself again. And then a new line, okay? Or we can say, well, let's print this out to begin with, because this is going, it's gonna work. It's gonna output the answer to us. So we'll say g plus plus standard equals c plus plus seventeen. Uh, what's it called? Area dot dot cpp. Yeah, dot slash a dot out. And this is apparently the answer. It does math for you. C plus plus can do math for you. You can also be a bit more precise and say what's happening. Colon new line perhaps. These are two C-out statements. Radius 5 is 94.985. And that's the final thing that I want to talk to you about is, uh, I should put it down here. Every statement in C++ ends, and oh, sorry, ends with a semicolon. That's like the period saying I'm done with this thing now, okay? That means I have included one piece of code for you to execute, okay? So it's like a sentence. And you need, to be, you need to be grammatically correct. So you always need to put your semicolons after you've completed your thought. Okay, so here's one semicolon, here's another. I did two C outs, and then I returned my zero. Okay, so that's the area of the circle. White space finally does not matter. Please be sensible. I can actually do this. Uh, you shouldn't though. Boop, 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 boop. Did I accidentally delete that? No. Boop. So this is all on the same line now. C++ doesn't care. It'll still run and compile and do everything the same. Just don't do that. Because then I can't read your code. That sucks. Uh, okay, we did it. We, we just wrote our own programs and we are the coolest people in the world right now. I hope you are excited. Uh, let me give you one last uh, thing, one last little example here, and then I'll give you a cool, uh, a cool demo after some exercises. So let's talk about variables, types, and input. So uh, that's quite a lot. Usually you're going to want to save information for yourself later, stored in RAM, of course, in your main memory. So you can make variables in C++. They are just boxes that exists in memory, that exists in memory. You have to say the type of the thing, type of your variable, the name of your variable, and the value that you're going to give it. And this sets up a box in memory that's like, uh, let me put it over here, called x, that holds now 42. So you can just say x instead of 42. That's the idea. So that's, uh, variables in C++, and there are a bunch of different types of things that you can store. Okay, so you can say int for whole numbers, and I want you to think of types like clouds. We've got the int cloud. We've got the double cloud. We've got the char cloud or care cloud, and then we've got the string cloud. There are more, but this is a good starting point. And inside of the int cloud, you've got whole numbers, integers, like 42, negative 42, 0, 1, 2, 12, <laughs> things like that. And so that's integers. Uh, doubles, on the other hand, are decimal numbers, things like uh, fractions. So 3.14, uh, negative 42.5. You can still have whole numbers, like 12.0 now. Uh, you can have like 
fancy notation, 6.02e to the e23, that the e stands for times 10 to the, uh, so that's all possible with doubles. Uh, char stands for single characters, and you make those in C++ with single quotes, not double quotes, so like a, l, the plus character, things like that. That's char. Uh, and then string you know now, it's just any number of characters all together. So uh, say my name, hi mom, new line. Those are all strings and they need double quotes. Single quotes are for single characters, strings are for large characters, or multiple characters. Okay, so let me give you an example of this. Uh, dun dun dun. How do I want to do this? Let's say uh, types and vars, or let's just say types, that's CPP. Why not? Uh, so I'm going to make this easier on myself. I'm going to copy all this in. And so I'm going to make some variables. int x equals 42. OK? And so I can see out x now and use it. It's perfect. Uh, types.cbp dot slash a dot out 42 cool I can actually change x x equals 43 now see out x that's fine uh, let's do some others double d equals 3.14 let's see out d and then a new line let's see out uh, char c equals I don't know my first initial. And let's see out C and a new line. And this will put all this stuff on their own lines. Oops, I made a mistake, it seems. And this is a compiler error. It doesn't trust me because I didn't do it right. I forgot a semicolon. Where did I do it? There it is. So in class, you would have been yelling at me about that. See, everybody makes mistakes. And so all these things are on separate lines. 3.14, L, uh, strings. If you want to use strings, you have to include the string library on their own. Uh, if you want to use the string type, you have to include the string library. Okay, and so now I can output that string and then a new line, for example. And so I got stuff going on. You can change all these, manipulate them. Uh, that's the beauty of it all. One last thing is getting input from the user. You can use C in instead of C out to get input. So you'll say something like, you know how C out, you said C out, please send information to C out. C in goes the other way. Please get information out of C in to fill in X. Okay. So here's how we can use it. We can say uh, C out type a number colon space and I won't give a new line because this will be like our little prompt and I can say C in X. So this sets X to whatever the user gives after they press enter. Which is very powerful. Now we can get stuff from the user and have it and so now X holds that new value for everything from, from now on for the rest of the program because everything executes sequentially. First this line, then this line. So now we're down here. Type a number. Now we have the number and we can see out that times two or something. How about that? This is really cool, I think. It's a very powerful concept. So it's waiting for us to type a number now. So it's waiting. The program's not over now. So I'm going to type, I don't know, 11. Hit enter. It'll get it, store it in X, and then it'll output 11 times 2 for us. 22. Cool, huh? OK, so uh, I think I have blown your mind enough. So I think we're done with all the new topics for this lecture. And uh, let's have some quick exercises, and then I'll give you a fun example. OK, so what does a compiler do? Take a second to stop your video and make your guess. And we'll go over the answer. Why not? We'll use Rainbow. Uh, so does it run your program? Does it store your program when it's run? Does it translate high-level languages into machine code? Does it make you a sandwich? I think 
you will recognize that uh, C is the right answer here. So a compiler translates high-level languages into machine code. Okay, if you go back to the slide, you'll, you'll remember that. And then, okay, what do you do if you want to compile x.cpp? Do you remember that command now? I've used it enough. G++, always standard equals C++17. Then you say the name of the file, x.cpp, and then you hit enter. And how do you run it? It always gets compiled to a dot out, so you can say dot slash a dot out if you're in the same directory. And it's kind of horrible if you want to write multiple programs in the same folder for them to always be called a dot out. So what you can do is optionally, I'm going to put dotted lines because this is not you're not typing the actual these things. Uh, optionally, you can say dash o space the name of the program dash o file name. And then it'll actually be called file name instead of a.out. And then you can run it with dot slash file name. So that's convenient. Let me do that for this last one. So instead of types.cpp to a.out, let's say dash o types. That's useful. And so now there's a full, there's a program called types in my current directory. And say dot slash types. Hit enter. And it's the same program. Okay, and it's different every time if I type a different number. Okay, so that's that. Uh, and then finally, this is on your own for a challenge. Write a program to convert a number to a capital, convert a number to a capital character. And my hint is, uh, characters are actually secretly numbers that you can add to. So try doing the character B plus three and seeing what you get, and see how that might get you halfway there, from zero to A, one to B, things like that. Okay, so try that. Ask me any questions that you have about it. I'd be happy to help you. Uh, and then now, just to end on a nice note, uh, I have a karaoke demo, demo for you. So I'm, we're going to make the computer sing to us. And I'm not going to test you on this, the code's a bit complicated. Uh, but it's nothing that is too much for you now. We're going to have the computer sing to us. Uh, let it go from Frozen, of course. And it's going to sing it in order. So it's going to be in line with the music. Uh, I'm not allowed to show you this. Like I, I can't include the sound for you because then my account would be banned. So you're gonna have to do this yourself. You're gonna have to try it yourself after I showed you how cool it is. Okay? So don't worry about all this stuff up here. Go to the main function because what I'm doing in this program to make a karaoke machine is I'm printing things and then I'm waiting a little bit. This pause function that I made, it waits for a certain number of seconds. So wait for one second, wait for one second wait for 20.25 seconds, wait for 3.083 seconds, things like that. And then print the lyrics that are now there in the in the actual song. So let's compile this with karaoke.cvp dash o karaoke. So now it's called karaoke and I can run it. And I'm going to go to this I'm going to go to this video, and obviously you can't hear it, but you should try it yourself. And I'm going to try and get this over here to us. Whee. Down like that. Maybe over here. And I'm going to have to be very quick about this. So I'm going to have to start the thing when it says now. That's the way I've arranged this program. So let's try it. So dot slash karaoke, and then I'm going to quickly go to the other program. Three, two, one, go. Okay, if everything worked out, it's going to wait for 20.25 seconds, of course, uh, and then it's going to like run the program. And darn, I can't like scroll down. But you will see it work. So hopefully, you're listening to Frozen right now because you're trying this yourself. And I think I press enter a little too quickly, but uh, you can see how it's singing along with the actual song. It might actually be more correct than what's on the video, who knows. Uh, but if you just time it right, it'll work, I promise. Uh, and it's really fun. So the, the computer is singing to us right now. Uh, and all it is, is stuff that you know how to do now. It just needs to print and it needs to wait. See out, you know how to do. And pause is a new thing that I have implemented here. So 
Uh, I encourage you to try this yourself. I hope that this is an exciting end to the first lecture. Uh, and yeah, I'll let you listen to the chorus on your own, I think. But yeah, it's just a bunch of CLs and prints, and you know how to do this now. So uh, programming is not scary, uh, and you're ready. OK, so I will see you in the next lecture now. I think that is all that I wanted to talk about here. So uh, yeah, I will see you then.